So today I'm gonna show you guys how I recreated Kyoto by Phoebe Bridgers. We're gonna go over how I would approach the sort of distorted drum tone that she goes for, harmonizing bass lines, and the very nuanced way that she uses gain staging with her guitar tones. But before we jump into that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I work as a guitar-based pop producer. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how to create their own pop music at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I've done an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you think that we would have fun working on a project together, check out the top link in my description. All right, onto the video. So I think the first thing we'll go over are the guitars here. Sound like this. So there were two things about the guitar work on this song that I noticed immediately. First is like how dense the chords are, even though they're really low. Like a large part of the character of Phoebe Bridger's style is the way that she plays these sort of like really dense chords lower on the neck. And by dense, I mean, there's a lot of intervals in the chords that are really nice, but they're really low and close together on the neck. So it makes a really simple part like this really dense in the mid-range. And another thing I noticed is the tones. So I used my Jazz Master for a majority of these tracks. And the main thing I did to get this tone was A on this amp, which by the way, it's this Pete Thorne signature from the Plugin Alliance bundle, which is really great by the way. It's on a really high gain channel, gain two, with the gain pretty far down. And then I rolled back my volume knob a bit. And what you get is this very honky distorted sound that can go from clean and muddy to distorted and really bright really quickly quickly. Like you can hear, depending on how hard I'm picking it, it can like flutter and go into that very distorted range. Another thing to note is that a lot of these tracks have a pretty aggressive high cut. Like there's not a lot of pristine high end in a lot of these tracks. And another thing I noticed is that a lot of the parts are panned sort of asymmetrically. So like you'll have a low part here that's panned all the way to the left. And then you might have another part that's also panned to the right, but it's not like evenly panned, which just adds a cool vibe to it. Almost a arranging it as if you're playing with a live band and you don't have an unlimited amount of guitar players. So from a tone standpoint, that's how I got a majority of this stuff. In terms of actually arranging the parts, we have this one. Which again is like a really low chord, really dense harmonically. Underneath that, we have this guy. which is just kind of pedaling on a root and a fifth. And I wanted to still keep it sort of lower in the mid range. From an EQ standpoint, this sort of like 200 to 300 honkiness is kind of important to this tone. Normally you're trying to cut stuff like that out, but I found that when you try to cut that out, it kind of removes that lo-fi vibe that it has. And then we have this guy, which is a little bit of a lead line. which is something a little bit higher up on the neck so that these three different parts are all in different ranges, but none of them are really in that higher register. Also, we added a little bit of warble with some RC20. And on most of these guys, what I have for processing after that, and for these guys and pretty much all of the other guitars that I have going on, after my amp and my EQ, which my EQ is basically adjusted for each part, if I don't need as much low end, I'll bring up the high pass filter a little bit more. And then this sort of mid-range cut, depending on how high or low the guitar part is, you actually need to move that cut because that honkiness kind of moves up the scale depending on the part that you're playing. I then throw a little bit of L1 at the end of it just to lightly limit the top of it and keep it consistent volume wise throughout all the parts. And then just because I want a little bit more of a sheen on it, I use some Moti T pretty aggressively because I wanted to control that sort of low end flubbiness that can kind of build up in patches like these. I wanted it to control that mid range honkiness, which again is crucial to this tone but I didn't want it to be excessive. And then I wanted a little bit of brightness without necessarily opening up that high end. So this was the best way I could do it. So that's it for the verses. And then for the chorus, we have these guys, which are the only times I double tracked it. Which for this section, I used the same sound, but I turned up the gain knob a bit, almost as if I was a guitar player in a band and I kicked on the next gain stage level for my amp. With this Phoebe Bridger stuff, it's best to arrange it as if you are in a live band because she is doing everything with a live band. Again, these guys are super low, just being really aggressive. And then we have this guy.
Now, I don't think this is exactly what they were playing on the record, but a thing that you notice when you start trying to dissect Phoebe Bridger stuff, especially with songs like Kyoto, a majority of the song is being taken up by the vocals. Like the mid range is almost all vocals and the mix on her vocals is like very distorted, but the guitars aren't meant to be like super audible. They're meant to be almost like supporting mid range layers to all of the other stuff that's happening, which in Phoebe Bridger stuff is mainly drums and vocals. And then under that, we have our bass layer. I didn't bother quantizing this because I felt like when I quantized it, it made it sound too clean. And with this, I felt like the live band feel of some notes being on and some being a little bit off. Like it added to the vibe, so I didn't really care. I'm using the Dirty Studio bass preset, lightly modified from Guitar 6, just to get that sort of plunky sound. I was using a P bass with this. Really didn't have to do that much tone shaping. Just I passed it enough to where it wasn't being distracting with the drums and then did sort of a lower mid-range cut. And again, a little bit of Moti T to sort of shaping it up a bit. Now, the more interesting thing about the bass in this song is the way that there's almost like a harmonized second bass layer playing a lead. which is the exact same tone, exact same patch. Maybe the high pass filters moved up a little bit more, but when you listen to it together, It just sort of continues that trend of playing chords and intervals in lower registers to really make the mid range feel alive. I'm assuming that she does this because a lot of her stuff is very vocal focused. And so when you move all of your mid range instruments like this really lower and it's super dense filled with stuff like this, it makes it really easy to add a bunch of vocal layers, especially since Phoebe Bridgers tends to have a bit of a higher voice. So here's what the basses sound like during the chorus. That higher melodic one only comes in when the rest of the drums come in, just to add a little bit of emphasis to that second half. But then yeah, these guys are side chained to the kick and the snare, as well as all these guitars and these other elements. I just talked about how there's sort of like a mid-range element to a lot of her stuff, and that her vocals are normally a part of that sound. Normally I just do instrumental stuff on this channel, so I use this tranquility patch in Arcade to sort of replicate that a little bit. Again, if you're doing a track like this, I would actually just track vocals in this style. But for this demo, I wanted to bring a little bit of that in here. And then one of the main things that stands out when you listen to the chorus of Kyoto is the trumpet. So for this, we're just using session horns in contact, just a super simple legato patch, which I find helps programmed horns sound a little bit better. So you can see when we hit the next note on this first note, there's a little bit of crossover that happens, which kind of makes the samples glide between each other instead of having this sort of staccato feel. Like real quick, if I just take those out real quick. Like, it's not a lot, but... Like, it just sort of swoops up a little bit more. Again, to get it a little bit grittier than it was in the sample, I used some Kramer tape and really drive to the flux and the record level. If I turn it off, like, it doesn't really have that much meat on it. Also, it adds a nice sort of weight and EQ curve to it. And to get it a little bit more like in the mix and feel like a live band, I have it going to a Valhalla vintage verb on a 70s room preset. I've been messing around a lot more with the Valhalla stuff. And yeah, I've been really loving their rooms and their plates. There's there's so much stuff to mess around with it. But uh, whenever I'm trying to get a good feel for a reverb, I always start with like a plate or a room and then maybe something like an insanely big ambient reverb. Those are normally the ones that I use as like testers for a new reverb, almost like ordering an American Americano when you go to a new coffee shop. It's just like kind of your barometer for what it is. So these vocals and that horn are also in a group with the guitars that are being side chained to the kick and the snare, which brings us to the final part of our sound, which are the drums. So during the verses, the drums sound like this. It's very kick heavy, little bit of light tom work, some hit on the snares. And also at the end of each sort of bar, there's this like open hi-hat turnaround thing. And then when it goes into the chorus to have a break from this, it goes to almost this like halftime rhythm before going back into it. Like here, you can listen.
Like there's an A and a B section and they keep going back and forth between each other so quickly that it really gives the song its own space. So I did something a little bit different with this. So for this one, I'm using some slate drum stuff. But what I did was on the mixer, and a lot of people don't know you can do this, but you can actually go to the bottom here and decide what stereo out you want it to go to. And what you can do is you can create some blank audio tracks and in Ableton, you set them to input, set them to receive from that plugin. And then you just go through and decide what stereo out you want it to receive from. And now you can route all of these channels inside of slate drums onto these individual audio channels and you can process them outside of the plugin, which is really awesome. I do it with a uh, superior drummer as well. So this first track here that has all of the MIDI and the actual plugin on it, if I solo this track right here, it only has the kick coming through it. And then this one has the snare. These are the toms. These are the overheads. And this is the room. And I did it because there was some pretty heavy processing that I wanted to do to like specific parts of the drum kit that I couldn't really do inside of Slay Drums. So as you can see, like I kind of removed a lot of the high end clickiness, which is a great way to keep a sampled drum kit from sounding too oversampled. A lot of times the click of the beater is what gives it away as being a sample. And then did some transient shaping. I just felt like there was a little bit too much sustain stain on it. Also did some stuff like that with the snare, brought out the attack a little bit more. And then whenever I have a snare that I feel like isn't really slapping enough, sometimes if I boost around like the 100 hertz, 150 hertz range, I can get it to have that sort of woofiness that I need. Not really doing a whole lot with the toms, just some shaping overheads and like all the ambient mics that I have on this channel. I wanted to remove the brightness. So again, some tape saturation on a slower IPS speed. After that, still had to reduce some of the high end. And then I side chained them very lightly to the kick and the snare, just so whenever the kick or the snare hit, the room mics can back away and then they can come back up very quickly after that and sort of give a tail to them. So they're still adding that release that you need from a room mic, but they're not like messing with the actual hit of the drum. Then all of these guys are grouped together using just a tiny bit of Motiti to bring out some boominess on the drums, just because because whenever I was listening to Kyoto as like a reference track, I would always think that my drums were like in the right spot, but then I would listen to the reference and hear like way more boominess a little bit of light compression some light saturation also there's a little bit of a tambourine hit here just on the off beats during the chorus and that's basically it from an arrangement standpoint another thing to notice about this arrangement is i also similar to the 1975 stuff had to put some kind of like lo-fi plugin on the master chain just because the sound of phoebe bridger stuff is very lo-fi there's not a whole lot of high end it's very distorted and tubey bringing up rc20 was kind of like the best way to do that pull that a little bit of excess mid-range on the master and then into a limiter. But yeah, that's everything. So uh, let's listen to what the track sounds like. Yeah, that's what the track sounds like. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe and do all that stuff below. Again, I do one of these videos every Friday, so I would really appreciate it. Also, if you like this video, here is a video that YouTube thinks that you would enjoy from me. But yeah, I will see you guys next week.